Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast, a podcast of Wheaton College. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. This is Dr. Crystal Downing, and I am joined by my co-director at the Wade, Dr. David Downing, and our expert (laughs) (laughs) producer, Aaron Hill. You don't seem convinced of (laughs) my expertise, Crystal. Well, I was trying to think of a new adjective. I've used so many adulatory adjectives for you. (laughs) Thank you. Our Sesquipedalian producer. (laughs) I'm going to put that on my business card. (laughs) We are delighted to be joined today by Dr. David Urban, who is a professor of English at Calvin University in Michigan, and he is a Milton specialist. Milton, who C.S. Lewis loved, and I just found out that C.S. Lewis first read Paradise Lost when he was nine years old. What? That's right. And then read it multiple years afterwards. Dr. Urban has edited a couple books of bibliographies on Milton scholarship, and he has a book called Milton and the Parables of Jesus published by Penn State University Press in 2018. And now he is working on a project that has to do with C.S. Lewis Mm. and Milton. Thank you so much, David, for joining us. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Okay. Did you mention he's a professor at Calvin University? I did. Oh, That's sorry. the first thing I said. Uh, oh, she sorry. said yeah, Michigan, <laughs> Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids, okay. Michigan, to be, uh, to be more <laughs> yeah. specific. We were saying before we started, we love David's voice. Yes. There's four of us. I think we should do, start out with a little barbershop quartet. <laughs> <laughs> Light a rose, I'm home again, Rose. Well, okay. David, why don't you tell us your Thoughts, and I'm talking to David Downing right now about um, Lewis's preface to Paradise Lost before we move to our guest. Well, I, Lewis is wonderful with openings and endings. And this mm. is another book or a series of lectures in which the opening is just so spectacular. So I'm going to start by reading the, the sh- brief opening to Preface to Paradise Lost. Oh, OK. Yeah. So he feels that Paradise Lost has been much misunderstood. And part of the problem is... T.S. Eliot. Whenever he wrote a book, he said, where am I going to get in my attack on T.S. Eliot? (laughs) So he starts out, (laughs) T.S. Eliot had the idea that Paradise Lost was not a very good poem because it didn't have quotable lines. You won't find, I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floor, silent seas. Yeah. And he actually, when Lewis looked at textbooks of uh, Paradise Lost, it would start out with underlinings where they're looking for these exquisite poetic phrases oh. and they're not finding it. Mm. So he's going to have to re-educate people on what kind of poem Paradise Lost is. Yeah, It's not a T.S. Eliot poem. Or, <laughs> or Shel so, Silverstein. Or Shel Silverstein, <laughs> <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> So he starts out saying, the first qualification for judging any piece of workmanship from a corkscrew to a cathedral (laughs) is to know what it is, what it was intended to do, and how it is meant to be used. After that has been discovered, the temperance reformer may decide this corkscrew was made for a bad purpose, and the communists may think the same thing about a cathedral. But such questions come later. The first thing is to understand the object before you. As long as you think the corkscrew was meant for opening tins or the cathedral for entertaining tourists, you uh, can say nothing about the purpose about them. Mm. The first thing the reader needs to know about Paradise Lost is what Milton meant it to be. Mm. So this is a vigorous defense of Paradise Lost. Lewis wrote a book called Rehabilitation, and he mm. loved to rehabilitate authors that he thought were being dismissed or overlooked. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, David Urban, yes. why don't you, you tell you us? Can, you know, you can just call me Professor Urban, too. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We can be real yeah, informal with each other. That way, you know. Okay. I think I, so you know which answers. David we're talking to. <laughs> I, I think it'll be our reply. I, I think it looks at me and says, David, I go, hello, I'm here. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Okay. Um, when did you first read Preface to Paradise Lost? Boy. Or if you want to ask, right. answer instead, what got you fascinated with Milton and C.S. Lewis. Right. Well, one thing to remember about A Preface to Paradise Lost, and it was published in 1942 by Oxford University Press, and it was originally a series of lectures called the Ballard Lectures that he gave in 1941. Um, But one thing that is very important to remember is that even though your average 
C.S. Lewis fan, even if that fan has read all the Chronicles of Narnia and all the great apologetics books and the space trilogy, what have you, the usual suspects. Most such fans are unaware that a preface to Paradise Lost even exists. Mm. But Milton scholars all know about a preface to Paradise Lost. Mm. It, it is to this day um, regularly cited and often as a point of departure. You know, mm. here's what C.S. Lewis said, and he represents the orthodox view, that sort of thing. It's not just that, but there's many points that he made about Paradise Lost that are things that people who came later, scholars who came later, have to address on one level or another. Mm. Uh, mm. Most, most importantly, actually, about Milton Satan, which we'll get to. Right. Oh, right. My mm. professor at UCLA said that Professor Paradise Lost, C.S. Lewis is the lion in the path of Milton studies. Mm. You're wow. going to have to grapple with Lewis at some point. What if a you're great going metaphor to be a wow. for Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. And it's remarkable because yeah. look at this book, uh, at least... In the He's studio, holding up. <laughs> it's very thin. It's a thin book. It's it's only um, you know maybe a hundred and thirty nine pages, including the index. Right, not long at all. But his context, and I think two interesting things about right. the context right. are: first of all, he wrote it during the war, yes. where a lot of people are thinking about evil right. and tyranny. Yeah, right. the tyranny. Nazis, yeah, Hitler. Exactly. Um, but also where modernism was still mm. infusing literary studies, yes. where you assume that we have progressed beyond the need to either take Christianity seriously, right. and of course, Milton, his whole worldview is imbued with his Christianity. And, and also where there was a value to this idea that the poem is a personal expression mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. poet mm -hmm. and his or her, but usually his, individual genius. And so yes. Milton wasn't valued that much. Well, Lewis wrote the poem in the middle of what was known as the Milton controversy. And there were a number of prominent scholars, including T.S. Eliot, who had... Uh, and, and Eliot kind of, after he, he uh, became Christian, he, he later kind of backtracked right, on this right. um, and said, oh, no, Milton really does have value. But uh, basically what was going on was uh, there's a challenge regarding the value of Milton in the first place mm -hmm. and whether or not it was Paradise Lost was actually really good poetry. Um, there was a movement to basically replace Milton as, uh, as the great poet of the 17th century with John Donne, mm. okay, mm. because of the, you know his his metaphysical conceits and right. that it's more complex and what have you than what Milton had to offer, mm -hmm. um, and so it he was basically writing on some level to defend Milton from such detractors, mm. okay, and and mm -hmm. he's considered unsuccessful in that uh, in that oh. particular arena. He's not considered the person who really pushed back the anti-Miltonists, as they're called. Oh. Um, hmm. But he was very successful on a number of other issues, including his portrayal of Milton Satan. Right. T.S. Eliot uh, was a great champion of Dunn. He wanted to elevate Dunn and de-elevate uh, Milton. Uh, and it's no mistake in that hideous strength that Jane Studdick who uh, Lewis considers uh, to be a rather superficial scholar, she's studying Dunn. Uh, yeah, she is. That's yeah. a little Never code for the readers me. that, oh, well, she's not. Lewis is kind of intellectual. Mm. By saying that, is he saying that she's kind of like pursuing the mainstream, like everybody's doing that and there's nothing interesting about it or what? Yeah, he, he said in the letter, you're supposed to pick up the fact that her dissertation is a bunch of derivative bilge. Ah. Uh, uh. So he, he has all those little Easter eggs. <laughs> Wow. Owen Barfield said of Lewis, everything he said reminded you of everything else he said. Yeah. So you're, you're reading along in that hideous strength and you go, oh, she's talking shit about Dunn. Yeah. Like, we know about her. Yeah. And, well, yeah. and he's just come off of Paralandra where he's, you know, clearly riffing on Paradise Lost. Yeah, so, right, yeah, yeah. right. Right. Well, and Par Paralandra is written just a little bit after Preface to Paradise Lost. Right. And the Screwtrape Letters comes out the same time as Paradise Lost. Abolition of Man, two years later. I see. Did I say Paradise Lost? I mean, a preface to Paradise preface. Lost. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Lewis wasn't that old. <laughs> anyway, um, and so all these 
very important apologetic and creative works of his, uh, you can see that all the thinking he was doing about Milton that came out most explicitly in A Preface to Paradise Lost influenced those works very strongly. Right, mm. right. If you just look at the 40s, it's amazing how productive he was in that right. decade, right mm. in the middle of the war. Yeah. It's uh, embarrassing maybe. how productive it is. I know. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're actually going to have two parts to the discussion. One is Lewis the Scholar, and the other is Lewis the Creative Writer. Right. right. Now, David, you have two books going right now right. in progress yes. that are going to address Lewis as a Miltonist, but also right. its effect on his imaginative writings. Precisely. And, and apologetic writings, yes. And apologetic yeah. writings, right. Right. Well, so let me just briefly state that the first uh, book, and I've published a number of articles on this, concerns uh, A Preface to Paradise Lost and its continuing influence upon Milton's scholarship. Mm. So much of Milton's scholarship is, ever since this book was published, was a response to A Preface to Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, Pro-Satan arguments were always in response to Lewis's denigration of the character of Satan in Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, what he was doing was writing as a response to the romantic wasn't it Blake that right. said yeah. that Satan is the real hero of Paris? Right. Yeah. He says that Milton was of the devil's so, party, party without, without yes. knowing it. Yes. Right. Yeah. So yes. can you summarize for just for listeners yes. uh, sort of how Lewis portrays uh, or, or it right. interprets Satan in Par- right. Paradise Lost? Well, what happens is, and this is a very important thing, um, the romantic elevation of Satan is based on his great speeches in books one and two of Paradise Lost, mm-hmm. especially the speeches in book one. I mean, if you just read them isolated from how his character denigrates itself, okay, later in the in the epic, you would think he was the most magnificent mm-hmm. figure. And he calls, excuse me, Lewis calls Satan Milton's greatest poetic achievement. Mm-hmm. But getting back to that uh that paragraph that you read, uh, David Downing, at the beginning of the podcast, <laughs> okay, um, the a- idea of intention, you know, what was Paradise Lost intended to do? The intention was not to elevate Satan. The intention, as far as Satan was mm-hmm. concerned, was to show how magnificently attractive of a figure he is, uh. okay, but also to expose his duplicity. And he's incredibly attractive to the reader. He's incredibly attractive to Eve when he gives his great rhetorical mm. temptation to her to, uh, a- as a serpent, right, to eat of the fruit. Mm. But Lewis's emphasis is that Satan is a fraud. Mm-hmm. And if you are, you know, taken in by Milton's Satan, then implicitly, right, that's, that's saying something about ourselves and our mm-hmm. own attractions. But mm-hmm. he wanted to, um, what Lewis said is that Milton was trying to give the devil his due, that is, show how attractive he is, but that there's an overall denigration of Satan's character as the epic continues. And the last time we see Satan is in book 10 of Paradise Lost. He's like celebrating with his his other minions in hell that oh yeah Mm -hmm. you know i got them to eat the fruit etc etc and all of a sudden he and all his cronies are turned into hissing snakes Mm -hmm. by the by god's power that's working upon them even Mm -hmm. as they're in hell Mm -hmm. and that's the last thing we see of of satan in paradise Mm -hmm. lost is is this uh, one who's completely under God's power, even as he thinks he's the champion. Mm. I wanted to mention the turning into snakes and screw tape letters. Screw tape gets very upset because his mentee is not doing well at keeping this Christian patient from falling away from his faith. And he gets so upset, he turns into this gigantic insect. And it's oh. funny, but I think that's a, yeah. an echo of right. what happens to Satan in huh. Paradise Lost. Precisely. Mm. Yes. Mm. And, and uh, the influence is all over the place, especially in the works within that kind of five, six years of when he wrote Preface to Paradise Lost. Mm. But of course, you see it, as, and as I'm sure we'll talk about today, you see it also very explicitly in The Magician's Nephew, which of course isn't mm-hmm. published until the mid-50s. Mm. Right. Mm. Uh, let's, let's finish up with some of the critical thoughts and then go on to the imaginative influences. We have to talk about Paralandra and we have to talk about Magician's Nephew. Right. Yeah. Um, what else was Lewis trying to accomplish in uh, the preface to Paradise Lost? Well, another thing he was trying to accomplish was 
there was this notion kind of going along with the romanticization of Satan. There was a notion that romanticized Adam and Eve's eating of the fruit. Okay. Mm. And, and especially the idea that, that, um, Adam is performing some kind of great act of sacrifice. Oh, right. You know, oh. and uh, which of course mm-hmm. is completely bogus because, um, as one of my students said in class one time, well, a sacrifice needs to be efficacious. Okay. It's kind of like when I was in Little League, for example, um, one of my teammates, um, you know, there are runners on first and second, and he bunted, but there were two outs, and he bunted right back to the pitcher, and that was the end of the game. Right. And he said, well, I was trying for a sacrifice. It's like, no, you, you can't sacrifice when there are two outs already. The sacrifice isn't efficacious. You can't advance anyone. And so this so-called sacrifice that Adam makes, because he says, I'm going to die with you. You know, I'm, mm. I can't lose you. You're too wonderful. It's a very romantic notion. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But, but, uh, what what, what Lewis specifically criticizes him, he says, what Adam did, there's a great comment that Milton's narrator makes at this point, that to, to Adam, the situation seemed, seemed remediless. Mm. And Lewis focuses on that word seemed. And he said, well, God might have had other cards for Adam. There might have been another solution. What Adam does not do is pray. Mm. He could have prayed. He could have, for sure, what he should have done is obeyed God's word and not eaten the apple himself. You see? Mm-hmm. see in Paralandra mm-hmm. where a Ransom asked the king, what would you have done if you found out that the queen of Paralandra had indeed fallen to the blandishments yeah. of Western? Mm-hmm. And the king says, well, I would have had to seek God's will apart from uh, my wife, Dinadra. Right. Yeah. And he's, he's correcting the mistake right. that Adam made. Right. Precisely. Right. There's a great Precisely. word we need to get into this podcast, which is uxoriousness. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's Lewis's word for it. Right. Right. But I'll, the, I'll, I'll yeah, go ahead. Go on. I've, I'll, I was just going to say, uh, he has a great section on hierarchy. Right. And he says that uh, there's a great chain of being with God at the top and unformed matter and American politicians at the bottom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And. So uh, sound like Lewis. He didn't like Americans or <laughs> yeah, politicians. He might, he might have said that. Uh, but there's there's errors. One is um, having the wrong attitude toward your natural equals. You're a tyrant uh, if you try to rule your equals, and you're guilty of servility if you allow yourself to be ruled by equals. Right. And then in terms of your natural inferiors, one is rebellion against authority, which certainly we see in Satan, and one is remissness which is not ruling the way you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And so the husband is supposed to rule the wife in this hierarchical scheme. And if you are ruled by your wife, then you're, you're guilty of a sin against the the great chain of being, I think. Uh So where does Eustorius fit into this? He has a, in the chapter, it's just a very brief chapter, but very important chapter. It's called the fall. It's chapter 18 Mm -hmm. of preface to paradise lost. And the first words he writes is Eve fell through pride. And he discusses that whole matter. Um, and then when he transitions from Eve to Adam, he writes, Adam fell by uxoriousness. Mm-hmm. Define that for our, some of our listeners. Well, it, it's uh, basically the idea of a man who is overly, shall we say, overly enchanted by his wife to the point where he makes bad decisions where he allows himself to be ruled by her okay um a, a great parallel would be samson in right. uh the, the right. case of between samson and Del- delilah okay and um uh, milton actually addresses that matter in his closet drama there's a, a dramatic poem entitled samson agonistes and that whole matter right. of, of of samson's exoriousness towards uh, Dalila, as Milton called her, comes up, and it's a parallel issue going on from Lewis's perspective with Adam in relation to Eve. It can be translated wife worship. Yeah, sorry. Right. I mean, translated, defined, excuse me, it can be defined as wife worship. So Adam was the first yeah. henpecked husband? Is that what we're <laughs> saying here? Uh, well, uh, well, well, well <laughs> let me but, but, put in what Sayer said for those of <laughs> oh, our okay. listeners who Here are disturbed comes the female by perspective. this. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Crystal. Sayers, um, and this was in in the forties, said to one of her friends who was complaining about Lewis's attitude towards women. She said, 
Yeah, unfortunately, C.S. Lewis got all his views of women out of Milton. <laughs> <laughs> well, the point is, as far as Lewis is concerned in this issue, is that Adam had free will, just like Eve did. And instead of recognizing that the issue is that God gave a command, and so now that Eve has disobeyed it, and now that Eve is moving towards death as a result, and you're, you see in the epic paradise lost this garland of roses that he's woven for eve it, it wilts in his hands as she approaches and it, it's uh anticipating this mm. death in eden mm. right and the point is he says how can i live without you right how can i live without mm. you i can't so i need to join you in death is his basic point and he it's a choice though it's a choice he acts like it's a fated reality for uh, him, you see? Yeah. And Lewis's point and Milton's point is that he didn't have to do that. He could have done something else. And um, he even, uh, but he doesn't want to. He's like, well, if, if, if you die and I live, then God might give me another Eve, but I don't want that. So mm-hmm. um, it seems remediless to him, but what Lewis's point is, is that he could have prayed, he could have, sought God out and he doesn't do it when they finally are repenting at the end of book 10 he's leading her they're they're kneeling down before God together in prayer that's how book 10 Mm. ends book Mm. 9 where the fall takes place there's no prayer Mm. Mm. interesting there's something slightly ironic about Lewis explaining all this and talking about the natural authority of the husband over the wife and the authority of the parents over the children but he's writing this great explication of this worldview. And then he goes home to Mrs. Moore at the kiln. Just, yes. Jack, can you bring me a hot water bottle? Jack, can you peel the potatoes? <laughs> In many ways, he uh, was sort of under her thumb at home, even while mm. he's writing these great treatises on the, the great chain of being. Of course, he considered her like a mother. He called her like a mother. Right. So he yeah, was she's obeying a mother his figure. mother. Right. <laughs> I won't go. I won't go to the other <laughs> other uh, possibilities that people raise. I, I'll just I'll just defer yes. to your expertise as the Lewis scholars. Well, uh, I, I'm jumping ahead on the fiction, but all through the Narnia Chronicles, hmm. you, the bad characters they're often sinning against the hierarchy, the nature of. Uh, at the end um, of Voyage of the Dawn yeah. Treader, it's okay for Reaper Cheap to seek Aslan's country because he is uh, a knight errant. He's an independent operator. Yeah. But when Caspian wants to go seek Aslan's country, they'll say, you can't do that. You're the king. And Aslan ha- actually has to appear and explain yeah. to him that he would be guilty of remissness. So a lot of the, uh, the plot structure in the Narnia Chronicles, he's actually mm. reflecting this Miltonic view of the hierarchy. Yeah, hierarchy right. Right. And, and, and you can see how, while there are some challenges with that, as Crystal has highlighted, <laughs> for us, it's, it's a category that I think we've lost that might be helpful for us to reclaim in some way to think about in terms of stewardship over creation, right. remission in terms of our, our uh, being stewards and our responsibility to care for beings that are you know, below us in the chain of being that yeah, it might be helpful for us to reclaim a little bit, you know, right. even if we need to maybe do a little bit of reflection on well, mm, the other thing who is, is our equal. To recognize right. is that for Lewis, as with Milton, this notion of obedience to God, regardless of your views on various other matters, uh, we should be unanimous in our notion that God is at the top of the hierarchy and that right. obedience to him is absolutely essential. And it's important to recognize that according to, to Lewis, this notion of obedience is the essence of paradise lost, that mm-hmm. obedience to God will make men happy and disobedience to God will make men miserable. Mm. And uh, in that, he's actually rifting off of uh, Joseph Addison, the great 18th century critic, the one who founded The Spectator. Right, right, right. right. Uh, He wrote a series of articles of critical thought on Paradise Lost that he published in The Spectator in 1711 and 1712, and that was his conclusion regarding Paradise Lost. It's a matter of obedience making people happy and disobedience making them miserable, Mm -hmm. and Lewis quotes him and reinforces that matter that that view, that summation of what the poem is really about, 
in the preface to Paradise Lost. Mm-hmm. And he says somewhere she shouldn't have argued with Satan or listened to Satan or tried to intellectually engage. She should have just obeyed. Uh, it's really a matter of the right. will. It's not a matter of the intellect. Right. Yeah. Well, right. you see that in, in Paralandra where uh, the mm-hmm. Eve character, right. Ransom realizes it's not a matter, winning is not a matter of her finally deciding because he's, you know, the Satan character is not going to give up. And so he ends mm-hmm. up just having to, to fight him, you know, right. physically. Right. Yeah. As Kill opposed him. to. Right. The, well, but that's so different. I'm sorry. I don't want to. No, interrupt no, no, you're you. fine. You're but, but, but that's what makes Paralandra a very interesting rewriting of. Um, Paradise Lost is that in Milton's Paradise Lost, the dialogue between Satan, you know, disguised as a serpent, right, mm-hmm. and incarnating the serpent, and Eve is very long and very complex, and she never eats of that fruit until she is basically justifying her decision as she speaks to herself and speaks to the tree, okay? mm. and she sounds at that point very much like Satan. She's using oh. his arguments. But the point is, Milton makes clear that it is her free will decision, mm-hmm. okay, and she is responsible for it. And what's different is in Paralandra, he really gives the queen much less of this autonomous free will. I mean, the idea of, of someone coming in to rescue Eve, that's just not what's going on. I mean, she left her husband to go and, and uh, prune the garden separately for means of efficiency in Paradise Lost, mm. okay? So Adam's not on the scene. Yeah. Adam's not on the scene. And, um, and of course, Paralandra, right, the, the king, right, in, the, in the, these, these little islands, right, that are floating, and right. he's stepping on one part, and she's on another, and he floats away, yeah, and they're away separated. from each other. But Ransom has come, and he's there. He's saying, don't listen to this guy. You know, yeah. don't listen to Weston. Mm. And then he winds up killing Weston, and he's the one with the free will decision. He's the one. It's like, oh, should I attack him or not? Yeah. But but he's he's protecting her to the point where you can really say that ultimately – her free will is replaced by Ransom's free will. Oh. Mm. Well, I, would, I, would, I would clarify. I wouldn't say that he kills Weston. Uh, Weston says, I call that spirit into me. And then he has some kind of a demonic seizure. Yeah, yeah. And he bites off the, a glass bottle. And after that, he's, he's an animated corpse. So I, was, I would argue that uh, yeah. Ransom is destroying the vehicle mm-hmm. which some sort uh-huh. of satanic force is uh, using. So some people say, well, how can you justify murder? But I don't think Weston's really a, a living human being by the time he grapples He's, Yeah, with Weston him. did that to himself, yeah. yeah. I also get the impression, at least, and this is just my reading apparently, so feel free to correct me, Lewis expert and Milton expert. Well, I've already been room. corrected, okay? So <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> Sorry, I, sit, I stand correct. Sorry. I sit. I'm in a chair right now. But I, so I sit corrected, and I defer to the Lewis Sorry. scholar, and, and but, don't I feel like an idiot. But that's, <laughs> that's good. I'm learning. Okay, go on. But, yeah. but my, my reading was that uh, the queen has numerous interactions with Weston, the the unmanned character, yeah. where she does exercise free will and she doesn't give in to the temptation. But the sense that Ransom gets is that if this goes on, right. eventually he will wear her down. He's wearing and her so down. So she's yeah. had mm-hmm. successful encounters where she's rebuffed him, but over time he starts to see her thinking changing. Right. Exactly. You know, she's mm. admiring herself in the mirror. She's right. wearing the coat of the animals that right. he's pulled the feathers. The feathers, and, yeah, right. And right. so there's a sense in which there's only so many times that you can say no to temptation. Right. And mm. so he needs to sort of remove the temptation. But she has successfully rebuffed him. Yes. But she's not infinitely capable of doing right. it. At least that's the way I've read it. Yeah, I always wonder where they got a mirror good, I think on, that's a on good reading. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> I don't see a lot of industrial yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> No, Weston, there Weston on... brought it with him, didn't he? Oh, yeah, that's probably the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you could argue that Weston's argument uh, for the uh, green lady is actually subtler than the serpent's argument for Eve, because he says he's telling you not to stay on the fixed land overnight, which is the, that's the don't eat the apple or don't eat. Right. Exactly. Somebody correct me, please. No, that's it. That's the equivalent. That's the equivalent. It doesn't make sense, but for whatever reason you need to obey, even though it doesn't make sense from an outside perspective. Right. Right. But then uh, he says, well, actually he wants you to disobey. He wants you to assert your free will. Right. In many ways, that's a subtler argument. Than the serpent telling Eve, 
you know, you should you become should, as gods. Yeah. yeah, he's withholding something from yeah. you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although keep in mind that in, in Milton's Paradise Lost, that temptation is far elongated. Right. And right. it's uh you know, there's there's various parallels between those uh, temptations. That's one of you know the one of the chapters I've got in my book is emphasizing or my book project is emphasizing the similarities and differences between uh, Satan's temptation in Paradise Lost and uh, Weston's you know, unmanned temptation in Paralandra. And and one really interesting difference is that in Paradise Lost, Eve has already been softened by a temptation that takes place in her dream that, you know, she's sleeping uh, there in, in book four oh, right. alongside yeah. Adam and Satan comes and is described in Paradise Lost Four as squat like a toad. Right yeah. near the e- ear of Eve, he's whispering, um, or he's speaking. Okay, doesn't actually use the word whisper in in uh, uh, Milton, although everyone assumes it's a whisper. Um, I, right. I assume he is too, because otherwise Adam would have woken up. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are you doing? Get out of here! Yeah, right, right. Wow. And, I, hate, um, I hate it when talking toads break into say, paradise. I know. I was like, are we really? You know, I mean, do toads whisper? Do they talk? Uh, <laughs> right, right, right. Well, uh, right. The the, the 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 amazing thing is that they're speaking at all, whether yeah, it's a yeah. whisper or a yell. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm 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 channeling uh, Samuel Johnson there. If anyone catches the illusion, but but in any in any event, um. The issue is she has this dream where this attractive angel comes and and calls to her. She thinks it's Adam calling to her, but it's really this dream angel who, of course, is is Satan. Mm -hmm. And uh, he comes and he's telling her, oh, you know, all of heaven adores you and says really buttering her up and saying you need to eat of this fruit. And here's all these reasons. And there's like it's like a pre-temptation. And he eats it in front of her and she's just shocked. But she seems kind of turned on, actually. There's a kind of a sexual aspect mm. to it. Mm. And then she says, I could not help but taste. And so presumably she's eating it, and they fly up together in exhilaration. And then they, as her dream's ending, she comes down. And it's again, it's, it's almost like a sexual experience that she's mm. had. And because it's a dream, she's not morally culpable for it because as Adam explains to her, your reason kind of goes dormant at night, but your imagination, your fancy Mm. can run wild. Mm. And that's what happened here. He doesn't really understand Satan at that point. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, Because Mm. he hasn't been told about Satan until Raphael comes in the next book. But the point is, uh, Eve has already had her fancy, her imagination infected. Mm. Okay. And before she gets tempted. And when you talk about uh, Weston trying to, wear her down that's what he's doing he's he's weighing her down in her imagination and fancy uh so even though he doesn't you know among other things among other things and that's yeah. why he gets her all gussied up like that yeah but, vanity and right, hopefully the van- that exactly pride. the vanity mm-hmm. right and the whispering that he was doing in book four while she's sleeping Mm. Uh, Milton's narrator says that Satan is whispering discontented thoughts into her Mm. and uh, uh, thoughts that will engender pride. Mm. I was just reading in my Bible study this morning that just as there was this Jewish tradition that the serpent in Genesis was actually Satan, because, of course, the Bible doesn't say that, they also, later Jewish tradition, developed this idea that Satan appeared to Eve as an angel that kind of sexually aroused her. So right. Milton well, must have been aware of yeah. that Midrash tradition. Yeah, he, he was a uh, conversant, and there's books on this, Milton and Midrash, for example. Oh, uh, wow. So that he's conversant with, uh, and again, to what extent, uh, on some level that's speculative, right, but that he was conversant with the Midrash tradition. And, and so Midrash, just yeah, Midrash, real quickly explain yeah. that word. Midrash. Midrash was uh, Jewish scholars, rabbis, interpretation and extension yeah. of biblical texts. And you could so, so actually it's not say... A med- we're saying it's not a medical condition. Right? No. no. No, it's not what you... <laughs> Every once in a while we want to stop and define yeah, the term. Yeah. Okay. It, it would almost be the equivalent of like commentaries that we right. read, but, yeah. but they took on more of a authoritative uh, sense. For there, right. there was a contemporary of Milton's named John Selden uh, who... There's a uh, well-known Milton scholar named Jason Rosenblatt, who's the son of a rabbi. 
and uh, oh, I know him personally. Wow. And he came out, uh, you know, he's got like an article called Milton's Fam- Favorite Rabbi, and it's about oh, John Selden, oh, who is, of course, he's not, he's not Jewish, you know, but I mean, um, yeah. and there's a book that he came out with uh, just a few years ago on Oxford University Press that focuses on John Selden, but discusses Milton and, and Selden's influence on him quite a bit. So there's a whole established line of scholarship that addresses these matters. Mm, yeah. wow, I wanted cool. to go back, can I go back to imagination? Yes. In, in Screwtape Letters, yes. Lewis says the human personality can be seen in concentric circles, almost like a, a target. Mm. And the outer circle is imagination, and the middle circle is intellect, and then the mm-hmm. inner core is yeah. will. So what's happening with Eve is planting these thoughts of eating yeah. the fruit in imagination, right. and then making arguments that you should be as gods. Yeah. And then finally, but Lewis always felt, people would write and say, I'm not sure about my motives or, uh, and he would just say, well, just do the right thing. Your faith is based upon right. your will to obedience, yeah. not to your rationalizations or your, your mm. imaginative yeah, cause excursions. He, he, yeah, he's he sort of like, well, imagine what it would be like to live on the dry land. And, you know, right. he sort of introduces like, you know, well, just think about what it would be like if you could live there and you didn't get blown around and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Mm. I, I was going to ask um, if we could just maybe address the scholarship side and then maybe turn to the because we've been kind of going back and right, forth. Yeah, right, yeah, you're right. Is there anything else in terms of the impact of Preface to Paradise yes. Lost on Milton scholarship that um, uh, you feel like is yes, worth mentioning? Yes, Um One of the most interesting things, in addition to Satan, in addition to the whole situation with Adam and Eve, um, one of the most interesting things is um, that Lewis is accused by any number of scholars, and this has continued into the 21st century of oversimplifying Milton, Mm. uh, not seeing the complexities. You always just focus on obedience and disobedience, that kind of thing. Um, And there's some legitimate criticism there. There's some legitimate Mm. criticism. But one thing that, um, and this is actually how my first article on this came out in 2011 in Milton Quarterly, and I noticed that any number of Milton scholars were misrepresenting or taking him out of, Lewis out of context because he mm. was saying that at one point he says that I'm trying to prevent people. He had this this um, chapter where he was discussing the significance of the apple, okay, mm. in, in Paradise Lost. Now, it's okay, in, in Genesis, it doesn't say it's an apple, but in right. Paradise Lost, we know it's an apple because Milton says so. <laughs> so anyway. Um, but that but had been a tradition course, around for course. a long time. Of course, of course. I know, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm just yeah. joking. But anyway. <laughs> As I said, I did win Best Sense of Humor my graduating <laughs> junior high class. I know you guys are the ones telling the jokes today, but, you know, I can, I can, I can punch with the best of them. No. <laughs> At least the best of them in my eighth grade class. But in any event, um, but uh, he's, he's saying, you know, I'm trying to prevent certain questions here um, regarding the apple. You know, it's not a question of whether the apple had some mystical qualities or whatever. He's like, it's just an apple. The issue is it's about obedience and disobedience. Right. So then... A number of scholars, and this is this has happened more recently, said that specifically that Lewis said that the whole purpose of his writing a preface to Paradise Lost was to quote prevent certain questions from being asked, you know, you know that kind of thing. And so they totally take out of context him trying to prevent a question regarding one, you know, removed issue. Oh, and the saying apple? that the apple exactly. Well, well, did the apple have some kind of you oh. know mystical quality, gotcha. drug drug like qualities, uh, or whatever uh, magical qualities, that kind of thing? Um, and he's saying no, it's just an apple. The issue is disobedience yeah. or obedience. So then they took that out of context and said that the whole point of him writing Paradise Lost and look, we're quoting him himself was to prevent the asking of questions. Oh. Wow. Okay, now, and what I've what I've said, first of all, it's completely out of context, but the other thing is, and they say that he stifled discussion. You know, he was such a powerful, strong critic, right. you know, the, 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 <laughs> the um, anxiety of influence upon all future uh, right. critics of Milton, that how can you possibly go against C.S. Lewis? So he was trying to stifle all discussion. And the wow. fact is, the fact is, if you look at the history of Paradise Lost criticism, after Lewis, it just exploded as people were responding to yeah. him about this, that, or the other yeah. thing, and they're still doing it. 
Mm. And they're still doing it. So the notion that he was oversimplifying everything and, or that he was somehow a critical tyrant who was trying to prevent <laughs> yeah. people from thinking for themselves. One of the frustrations of, of Lewis studies is seeing how he's misquoted or taken out right. of context. Yes. Yes. There's a, there's a yes. scene in Great Divorce. You know, we should have mentioned the lizard whispering in the guy's ear. Right. It's being something like the toad of Satan. Yes. And, Oh, uh, yeah. Right. But I wanted to go back. Right. There's a scene, they get off the bus. Now, these are condemned souls who yes. come up from hell to the precincts yeah. of, of heaven. And he says they, they had no substance to them in that solid reality of heaven. They were merely human stains on the air. Hmm. Yeah. So it's a great image of their, their insubstantiality. So I'm yeah. reading your critic. He says, people don't seem to realize that C.S. Lewis was a real misanthrope. He once described <laughs> human beings as human stains on the air. Oh, so they have this the phrase uh, quoted. Yes. Yeah. And That's exactly it. it. Uh, yeah. At first, I wanted to write a rebuttal, and then I decided just to go over to the guy's house and punch him. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it was yeah. cleaner just to... Uh, but you know, when you're dealing with somebody like C.S. Lewis, who's such a just, I mean, monumental figure, and he's so brilliant and so insightful, so smart, it's it, sometimes the easiest way to, you know elbow your way into the discussion is to take cheap shots. Yeah. Right. right. And it's just the right. way it works. Well, and the trouble is, for the very reasons you're talking, that he is just such this formidable figure who's also known to be a Christian apologist, you get people quoting him out of context, not only from an anti-Christian perspective, but also a lot of Christians oh, who yeah. just use him and quote him out of context yeah. to reinforce positions that they want to make yeah. anyway. Oh, you see so, that a lot with discussions about evolution and creationism. Yes, He's, yes, and the Bible. Lewis yeah. is on everybody's side when it comes to those questions. Right. <laughs> yes. Because they just cherry pick sections yeah, and read them. Cherry a pick, way. perfect. Yeah. Well they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but maybe the sincerest form of flattery is people use you for their proof texts, like yeah. the Bible. Yeah, it's like well, Saint Paul said, "You are, but Lewis said." You it's know? very, <laughs> so, it's very uh, convenient that C.S. Yeah. Lewis always right. thinks exactly like right. the person who's right. interpreting him. Right. Yeah, right, right. And the trouble yeah. with scholarship too is these scholars they're more interested in getting something published, so right. they're looking for a little tidbit to despise in right. Lewis. Right. Yeah. Well, like in the previous podcast you did on the discarded image, right? You talked about how when you were in graduate school, right, you read the discarded image. And just, I read the, <laughs> The introduction and the this conclusion, is true. And, you know, true, guess, right? reading the whole book. Well, not so much, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that goes on as you, as anyone who's a scholar knows, that goes on in scholarship, yeah, you know, all the yeah. time. Yeah. And, yes. and, uh, right. It's but but uh, and one thing is that Lewis, even as he was trying to champion Paradise Lost over and against the anti-Miltonists, as they were called, there was a guy named Levis who was very oh, uh, right. uh, F.R. Right. Levis, right? Yeah. Who was, was kind of the uh, even even really more powerful in that than T. T. S. Eliot, of course, was much more famous, but Levis gave a much yeah. more compelling argument oh. against it. And his wife uh -huh. Queenie yeah. just wrote this nasty Queenie and Levis. Yeah, they really nasty do sound like villains. Of, by well, Levis Levis. is the last name. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Levis. I know, I know, I'm right, just right, saying. Right, right. Queenie but, Levis. But a nasty yeah, review. Right. Queenie wrote a nasty review of Dorothy Sayers' Gaudy Night. Wow. You know, and so I think there they're was power, an anti-Christian yeah, right, element right, yeah. there. Yeah. Well, but, but, he, but it was weird because he... Uh, he actually briefly discussing books 11 and 12 in, in A Preface of Paradise Lost, and that's when Michael basically appears to Adam and Eve, and he starts talking to Eve. Eve gets put to sleep, and she learns all this stuff in a dream, actually. Mm. So her dream gets redeemed, okay? Oh, dream, but but, they, at, but mm. Michael is explaining or even showing kind of big movie screen, as it were, here's what's going to happen in the future, and it's all about how humanity and its sin and then the history of Israel, and then it all goes all the way through the redemption of Christ. And it's actually very interesting. It's kind of a, a salvation in history in the future. Mm. <laughs> future salvation history, as it were. I think Lewis um, criticized that. He, yeah, well, that's, he that's called a, that. Uh, like, uh, oh, go ahead. Lump, well, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, go ahead. He calls it a untransmuted lump of futurity. That's what he called <laughs> yeah. books 11 and 12. And so to this day, anyone who's kind of discussing books 11 and 12 they say, which, of course, C.S. Lewis described as an untransmuted love of futurity. <laughs> and I mean, it started out by the people who wanted to defend these books, actually. 
Um, but you always have to kind of get past Lewis, even if you're just even if you're just kind of repeating the phrase right. just because it sounds so funny. You yes. know what I mean? But, yeah. uh, oh, we did experiment and criticism, but I don't know if we mentioned that a lot of his target in experiment criticism is the the Levises. Mm. Uh, you know, she yeah. calls herself Queenie. That's already a sin against <laughs> yeah. the natural order. You're, you're not a queen of anything. Uh, but yeah, he calls them the vigilance. They want to extract these moral lessons from literature. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. We've so, talked about them in previous episodes. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Professor Urban. Yes. As we try and wrap up a little bit, I know we talked yeah. about some some of the literature. Are there any other oh, yes. reasons or value, something to gain from reading Preface yes. to Paradise Lost to help us yes. understand C.S. Lewis's other literature? Absolutely. Well, I think that um, that's one of the things I'm trying to do in these projects is to show, again, this is a book that most C.S. Lewis fans, heavy readers of C.S. Lewis, they don't even understand it exists. And yet, if you read a preface to Paradise Lost, it helps you understand better any number of his other works. Um, you know, we've talked about Paralandra. We've talked about, uh, well, we really haven't talked very much about um, Magician's The nephew. Magician's Nephew. We see it in the screw tape letters. I've done a number of presentations on all of this. and Can you give us an example from ne- Magician's Nephew, maybe? You guys keep referencing that, but I'm not, I don't know that I don't see the connection. Well, um, okay, for example... So what you have in The Magician's Nephew is you have a situation, of course, we've already a fallen world at that point, and of course, Diggory has already blown it in the <laughs> past when he rang that bell, right. right, which Polly said, don't, don't ring it. No, no, but I have to. You know, again, again, yeah, he's like, yeah. oh, I have to. It's not my fault. You know, and of course, he rings it. She awakens. Next thing you know, she's come to the earth and is wreaking havoc. Okay. Yeah. And Aslan, first of all, when he's confronting Diggory, he... He leads Diggory to admit that, no, I wasn't charmed. I didn't have to ring the bell. I chose to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First he tried to say there was this enchanted atmosphere. And Diggory admits, I was only pretending. He says on page 121 of The Magician's, or at least my edition of The Magician's (laughs) Nephew. Okay. (laughs) And so what you see then is when he is told to get this apple from this special tree that will heal your mother. Okay, uh, and it, but again, you're not allowed to eat of it yourself. Yeah, that sort of thing. So we uh, see him encounter the witch, right? And she's eating one of the apples, right? Remember, and she's got that that uh, smudge on her face. <laughs> yeah, right. Remember that. And she, like Milton's serpent, Satan, in Book Nine of Paradise Lost, she tries to convince him that oh, you know, you're wrong not to eat of this. Aslan is trying to keep you down. Don't you love your mother enough, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, she, she, she keeps doing that, and, and it seems convincing. But he's like, no, I blew it before. I need to obey Aslan. I need to do the right thing this time. And, of course, the result is to the benefit of, of his mother and him, right? They're both allowed to share this continuing relationship of this deep love they've got for each other because not only does he save her, but he saves, as it were, himself mm. by not disobeying even that depiction of the scene, uh, this tree is in a walled garden, and right. uh, the queen Jadis, she climbs over the wall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, right. once again, Milton, it's right. Satan that climbs over the wall of right. Eden. in book four. So Instead it's very Miltonic. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. So then at the end, when he's talking to Diggory after he's actually obeyed, look what he says. Aslan says, that is what would have happened, child, with a stolen apple. It is not what will happen now you know if you had stolen the apple right these here would have been the consequences but he says what i give you now will bring joy it will not in your world give endless life but it will heal pluck her an apple from the tree the apple diggory brings back to his mother does in fact revive her health and the novel ends with a summary of the blessings that Diggory's obedience to Aslan uh, brings about to both his own family and to Narnia. And again, um, Aslan, I conclude this way, um, even as Diggory, as, as Lewis suggested regarding Paradise Lost's God, had other cards in his pocket, quote-unquote, that he dealt generously toward Diggory and his loved ones. So this idea that he was supposed to get the apple prematurely, as far as what the the, 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 the witch said, right? Mm. Um, he didn't do it, and by obeying what Aslan said not to do, he got those the benefit of the other cards, as yeah. it were, the other options. Yeah. You don't know, you know, you're you're tempted with all these what seem to be wonderful opportunities. Yeah. And if you give in to that, 
you never know what you would have gotten had you actually obeyed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That seems unusual because mm-hmm. normally Aslan won't entertain alternate realities. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Susan says, what would have happened if I hadn't looked in the magician's book and seen my friend? Yeah. And he says, well, you can't say what would have happened. This may be the only scene in Narnia where he gives you an alternate reality. He does. He tells been... you what the counterfactual would have been. But right, in other places, right. he says, that's not for you to know what, right, what right. would have happened or what, you know, what the impact that it would have had on somebody else's life. That's also fascinating to me because, and again, I hate to go back to Peril Lancer, but there's the parallels. Um, the In the end, when they're given the reign over Venus, it's on fixed land. And right. so God's intention the whole time was for them to live on the fixed land. He just didn't want them to live on this little squatty place and to disobey him and take it for themselves. They, right. they needed to wait, and then God would give it to them as a gift mm-hmm. uh, in, mm-hmm. in, the, in the right time. And so a lot of people theologically have asked the question, like, well, why would God not let them eat of a tree of knowledge of good and evil? Because later in Scripture, you see... Solomon asks for that, and God says, oh, because you ask for this right thing, I'm going to give it to you. And so you, there's this tension of like, well, why would God not want us to know the difference between good and evil? And it kind of right. comes back to that idea of it's not whether or not God eventually wanted to give it to us as a gift. It's that initially it was forbidden, and we took it, and the, and the timing was wrong. It was right. still disobedient. Right. So, Matt, exactly. It's timing. And, that's, and I just want to make sure I, I don't want to... I think I might have misrepresented something. Um, remember that Aslan told him just to get a seed from this one of the true. apples. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. and so she, he's just there to get a seed, and that's when he encounters the witch, and she's eating of the apple. She says, "Oh, don't you want one for your your mother? You're so terrible that you're not trying to." You know, I feel how the apple is, has changed me and made me stronger and more more powerful, etc. And so again, she's tempting him based on his love for his his mother. And it makes sense. What she's saying makes sense. But he's, no, I'm going to obey. I'm just going to get this seed. Brings it back to Aslan. And at that point is when he tells him to get an apple for his mother to cure her. Mm. Okay. And it's, it's all the more poignant because Lewis's own mother died of cancer. So mm. here he is imaginatively wondering, in mm. some other world, what the if? son could rescue the mother yeah. from this illness. Mm. Right. I even wonder if the queen's a black stain after eating the apple is Miltonic. Isn't there a scene in Pandemonium where he... Uh, Satan calls forth this beautiful tree. Yes. It looks like, well, I can do that too. Well, and then he takes a bite of it, but it, it's ashes. What happens is after they all get turned into snakes, then this tree appears with all these apples on it, and they all the snakes rush. To, remember mm-hmm. I said the last thing you see is them like right. snakes, and so they're all like needing moisture, basically. They're all like thirsty, mm-hmm. and they want the apples to kind of quench their thirst. It's kind of a strange notion. And they all go, and they eat the apples and the apples turn into ashes in their mouths okay mm. oh, and wow. so that's the, that's the last thing we see is them turned into snakes eating ashes that's a okay. great image of sin and the consequences yeah. of sin mm. right but i think even the the black stain on her her mouth is a reference to that well oh, sure i mean if you ashes. ate ashes if you ate ashes you'd have black yeah. stain yeah, on your right, mouth but, right. but but see getting back to to your question um this this notion of um how does a preface to Paradise Lost affect our understanding of Lewis's fiction? Again, it's that whole notion of, you know, it, it, Adam didn't take have the imagination, as it were, mm. to think about the alternatives that God might have had if he had actually obeyed. You don't even need to imagine it, really. All you need to do is obey, and then God will yeah. take care of mm. the other parts. And that's what happens with Diggory when he doesn't take the apple when he just takes the seed yeah and and so god or <laughs> as manifested in aslan here right mm-hmm. um did in fact have those other cards yeah. for him and so you see him thinking about it it's almost like you can use a preface to paradise lost to help explicate not just paradise lost but lewis's own writings yeah yeah, yeah this is a living lesson sometimes when we're in an airport, Crystal will order a Cinnabon. And I have this real temptation. I can tell there's real, real brilliance coming yeah, out yeah. here. I can feel it. And I, I go, well, coming at us. Do, do I get my own Cinnabon or do I chastise her for eating something? So, <laughs> so I had this kind of Adamic uh, 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 <laughs> dilemma there when we're in the airports. You can help her. You can help rescue her from her <laughs> own temptations oh, okay. by eating it for her. Oh, okay. And, yeah. it, and it doesn't taste like ashes. Let me yeah. tell you. Yeah. But you can see how that's a way for us. Stolen I mean, food is delicious, right? <laughs> I mean, Lewis is almost, he's almost framing that as, as a, it's a failure of imagination. 
yeah. it's that right. it's not just right. a failure yeah, right. of the will, but it's right. a failure to imagine that there get God that could God do has a plan. Else. Yeah, that yes. God is not just some cosmic killjoy who wants you right. to not have nice things or whatever, but who's got some again, right? That that famous thing that he writes: we are far too easily pleased. Right? right yeah. God wants to give us a you know we're we're satisfied with playing in the mud puddle when God wants to give us a vacation by the seaside. Yeah, mm. right. Okay, by the sea. Right. Yeah. Mm. And apparently, Andrew, one of the things I loved was the theological explanation of where evil comes from. I read this first time in college. It was my portal into the world of C.S. Lewis. And I'd gotten a lot of really crummy discussions of the problem of evil. Mm. Like, well, Adam sinned, and that's why children are born with uh, spina bifida, or that's why yeah, we have yeah, malaria. Yeah, yeah. It seems like there's a few steps missing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we're in a perfect world, and she's never disobeyed. And he says, well, have you ever been looking for a certain kind of fruit, and then another kind of fruit yeah. was presented to you? Yeah. Oh, yes, that happened. What if you said, I don't want that fruit. I want the fruit that I was pursuing or seeking. And she says, oh, that would be very bad. You have to accept what is given to you, not yeah. what you wanted. Accept the gift. Ecstatic. Yeah. yeah. And then he finally says, well, in our world, there was an angel who refused to accept what was given to him, and he still clings. Mm. And that was such a wonderful way to talk about how evil could come into a perfect world. Yeah. I remember how helpful it was for me theologically to read Paralandra as a college student. Mm. Yeah, wow. Yeah, definitely. Well, David, do you have any last comments? I just want to mention this one line where Lewis is talking about how you shouldn't be reading Milton looking for these great quotable quotes. And he says, to look for a good line in an epic is like looking for a good stone in a cathedral. Uh-huh. Right. One of those great analogies of Lewis's. Right, right. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, this has Professor been an absolute Irvin. delight. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. Bye. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, past collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.